Good morning, everybody. It is still morning. I just looked at my watch and verified. Thank you to the panel members for, uh, for joining me on stage this morning. Um, Diane Powers mischievously said, well, the guy from Google said there's two kinds of people at this conference, the geeks and the artists. What are you? And let me just say that policy advocacy is an art. OK. Right, guys? Right. Um, there's a great digital future in front of um, everybody in the content industries, as long as it can all get financed. And one of the big problems of our industries is that people won't pay for stuff that they can get for free. Uh, free is the best possible price for everybody. Uh, in fact, surveys show that most consumers, given the choice, will opt for watching ads in order to get their content for free. Of course, then they look for technologies that will allow them to skip the ads, too. So whether the industry can survive on an ad-based model only, I think, is, a, is a, a very open question. And it's one that my answer would be no. You need to have um, the additional revenue source of some sort of uh, subscription or, or, or per view payment. Ad-based models, however, can and do support a growing range of digital parasites. And these are entities which make their living by providing access to other people's creativity. Um, the conference in the last day and a half has, has discussed a lot of big numbers. I want to offer a few of, um, of my own. A recent study by brand protection firm Mark Monitor tracked web traffic to a relatively small number of websites engaged in sales of pirated products of various kinds. So just 26 sites selling counterfeit prescription drugs uh, got more than 141,000 visits per day, 51 million visits a year. 48 sites that were selling counterfeit consumer goods, like sneakers and sports shirts and that kind of thing, got more than 240,000 visits a day, or more than 87 million visits a year. 43 sites engaged in digital piracy of our content was more than 146 million visits a day, 53 billion visits a year, about nine visits for every man, woman, and child on Earth. So perhaps not unsurprisingly, it's our industries more than the media industries that are being um, uh, worst hit by online piracy. And the more we migrate to digital products and digital delivery of media products, the bigger the problem becomes. Um, at this point, the only people who refuse to see this problem are those who are willfully blind. Um, either they are ideologues who are blind for ideological reasons. These are the people, you know, information wants to be free and it should be free. Copyright for them is a bad thing. Or they're the parasites themselves, the companies, the pirate bay types, who steal the results of other people's creativity. I'm not going to name any other names, but everybody in the room could easily rattle off a long list of parasitic entities. For anybody who's not willfully blind, it's obvious there are too many websites, too many um, digital ways for people to um, access content that should be paid for without paying. Um, many of these websites exist purely to suck the blood of the authorized content producers and distributors. Now, in this session, we're going to talk about the reactions of governments and regulators to this development. We'll talk about some places like Korea and New Zealand, where new laws have been put in place in recognition of the fact that the Internet was becoming, at the same time, a very creative means of distributing content to people and a massive destroyer of value in the digital content industry. We may talk about other places as well where the governments prefer to put their heads in the sand and the result is that they watch their own content creators go broke or move away rather than risk the ire of people who want everything for free, the free downloaders. 
Now, let me start by describing some developments in the USA where this an interesting debate has begun, um, which will be drawing increasing attention in the future. The internet piracy industry in the US has gotten the attention of the entire business establishment because of numbers like the ones I gave a little earlier. Um, and because the US market is affluent and largely wired, so that internet-based piracy industry has spread, affecting not only soft products like media, but hard goods. Um, an earlier study by the same company, Mark Monitor, estimated that so-called rogue websites cost legitimate businesses of all types over $135 billion, billion with a B, uh, in lost revenue, and that was three years ago. Um, but there's a bit of good news for the media industry hidden in those numbers because we are no longer alone. The use of rogue websites to promote pirate e-commerce has produced a large coalition of economic interests from the US Chamber of Commerce to the labor unions who have all demanded action. And last fall, the US courts authorized law enforcers to close down about 100 rogue websites using US-based internet domains. They included retailers of counterfeit goods, sports equipment, shoes, handbags, and also distributors of online digital content. Then a further group um, of 11 sites specifically pirating streamed digital broadcasting content were closed in February of this year, and one guy in Texas running one of the sites was arrested and charged with criminal copyright infringement. Um, he, according to the Department of Justice now, not to the content owners, he sought to profit by intercepting and then streaming live sporting events, hiding behind the anonymity of the internet to make a quick buck through what is little more than high-tech thievery. Well, that's the Department of Justice, so I guess they're convinced. Um, everybody recognizes, however, that this type of action has a real weakness. The only sites that can be closed down under the US laws are the ones whose name, domain names are based in the USA. And given the international fluidity of the internet, many of the closed sites immediately reopened in domains like Montenegro, where follow-up action is unlikely, to say the least. But the next step is contained in new legislation introduced into the US Congress two weeks ago. It's designed to foreclose the lucrative US market to foreign pirates. That legislation would authorize the Department of Justice to file civil suits and get court orders against pirate websites. The department would have to publish notice of the action promptly upon filing, and it would have to prove to a judge that the website meets clear criteria that focus on the site's substantial role in online piracy. But then once the court order is issued, the pirate website domain would be publicized and US businesses would be ordered not to do business with that site. And that would include internet service providers, search service providers, and advertising servers. Those sites will therefore lose access to the US market. They can, of course, continue to do business with the good citizens of Montenegro. So this type of measure is not a panacea. Its enactment will be a step forward, but it's also true that others will watch what happens in the USA, and if legitimate US businesses benefit, you can be sure that other governments in Europe and Asia and other places will come under pressure from their intellectual property industries to take parallel kinds of action. So that's one of the developments in the world of uh, contesting piracy. Um, we're gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna join the panel. We're gonna have a group discussion of some other developments in this area. Um, and so let me, let me take my seat and we'll discuss some of the other develop, uh, ongoing developments. So, the microphone is working. Hello. On my left, uh, Macy Learn represents the uh, IFPI, the uh, Association of the Recorded Music Industry internationally. Macy, the music industry has enjoyed some success with uh, anti-piracy efforts because of support by the government of Korea. Can you tell us what's going on in that market? 
Yes, we're really excited about the Korean market, and I think, uh, and I think everybody in the room, and, and certainly those in Asia, from Asia, would realize that Korean music, Korean film, um, has really seen a, a huge success across Asia in the last uh, two or three years. Um, I think Rain, um, a big successful artist, was recently here uh, performing as well. Now, what, what we've seen in, in Korea is a very interesting um, uh, situation. It's where pieces of the jigsaw really fell together. You know, the, the government was very, very uh, supportive. Uh, in 2000, at the end of 2007, 2008, they started putting in a slew of legislation. Um, and they haven't stopped, you know, last month they put in another series of um, legislation, another piece of legislation, which is aimed to tackle online piracy and mobile piracy, digital piracy, as it were. Um, in 2009, they introduced what we, uh, in, on, in our industry, call graduated response. And you would all have heard about graduated response, I'm sure. So they introduced that in 2009. And as a result of this, uh, they've created a very conducive environment where the music industry in Korea have risen by 12% last year. And this, you know, this, the, the, I have looked at the numbers for this year, and it looks like it's going to grow again. Uh, and this is against a backdrop of a fall of about 10% um, worldwide. You know? and, and not just that, there is an increased um, renewed uh, interest in investment in local artists, local a and R. Um, and you know the market really is booming, so we're very excited about this, uh, and uh, I think this is a good sort of like case study for everybody to look at. Arun, you were talking earlier about some aspects of the Korean situation, which go to I think the the point of culture change. Can you talk about those for a second? I think one of the interesting things that happened uh, about ten years ago in Korea was in the video games industry. If you uh, were supposed to serve national service you could actually take an engineering or creative job in a game studio and you would be exempt from the military aspect. So what it popularized was this idea that being in a creative industry, uh, you had a legitimate career, you were able to produce your content, you were able to be creative, and at the same time, the, you, know, you look at your friends who are in the industry, you don't really want to steal the, the, the food from their mouths, so there became a, an aspirational protection uh, as opposed to, you know, pervasive availability of content, you could actually say, okay, I choose to uh, respect the intellectual property of this product because my friends are involved in the creative process. And I think that's a big change as more people create content in this part of the world through their relationships and their peers, they start to respect that aspect of the legal side of the, the content. And, and I, I skipped right into the question without introducing Arun, who represents the Games Exchange Alliance, which is a Singapore-based association of the games industry, uh, which has a regional view as well as being uh, based and focused on, on Singapore. Um, let me ask you a second question, Arun. Your industry has a kind of unique problem that I don't think the others face, having to do with buying software and paying to play. Can you talk about how that works out uh, and, and the particular problems that your industry has? Okay, so the, the biggest problem we found was the availability of game content such as the, the DVDs that go into consoles or are played on the PC. Uh, there's a hugely evaporated market. There's, there's hardly uh, any legitimate sales actually going on uh, from finished goods or box products. So the, the industry combated that by going to a completely different model. Uh, with online games being played mostly in this part of the world, you're able to offer the game for free, but you pay for items. So uh, that introduces its own problems, uh, where you have things like ghost servers, where people will set up a free service to play the game, but it's not the legitimate uh, server. The other challenge that ended up happening was, how do you collect revenue from the players? So, one of the big things that has happened is that we've got these scratch cards that are in each market and you have different vendors who are, who are providing these uh, scratch cards so that the consumer actually can pay. And what we were finding before that was when you had services like your, your Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, these services were only exclusively available to people with a credit card. 
and with a lot of the consumers in the market actually having a low disposable income, they don't have a credit card, so they have to rely on this ability to use a scratch card to top up their accounts. Is there an age issue? I mean, younger players don't have credit cards too? Well, that too, but I think there are a lot of markets, for example, Malaysia, where you can't register a, a Malaysian credit card for a North American service. So the, fraud, the, num the level of fraud in credit cards is actually huge, and chargebacks obviously hurt the, the, the merchant. Well, that comes into some of the uh, secure delivery type of issues too. Uh, my name is Isa. I represent the Center for Content Promotion. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of people in the TV and movie industry wish that they can charge for weapons and stuff during a movie <laughs> because there's some revenues to be made there. Um, but th definitely a, a, lot, a lot of the, the, the revenues and the returns come from secure content delivery. Um, uh, and the technologies that come with that. There's been a lot of wins in that area. I think, you know, the new channels, IPTV and other channels, you have the return channels for content um, uh, online for movies and TV. So, so, so those are really good, good uh, new channels for delivery. Sorry, John. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Um, Cause I, all right, here's, here's the intro I was gonna do for you. Okay. I was gonna say, <laughs> look, we've talked about changes in laws, changes in culture. Can you talk about changes in technology? Yes, absolutely. So, so if we look at what's been happening recently, um, we have a bunch of new channels for, for distribution, for, for delivery, for content delivery. You know, uh, there's mobile, there's IPTV, there's um, different platforms. Um, with that, there are different business models also coming up. So you look at um, paid models, you're looking at um, advertising models that's been successful. So, so the advertising models like Hulu, uh, is being replicated in, in the different, uh, different in, uh, countries too. Um, I know that iTunes question is gonna come up, but I'll, I'll leave that to you. At the same time, there's a bunch of developments in terms of really bad sites that are, develop, uh, that are you know, streaming uh, illegal content. Uh, pirate boxes we can find uh, in different places where you can basically have free pay TV for the rest of your life. That's a big problem. Um, the interoperability of different devices is also another uh, big area I think we need to look at because there's a bunch of different manufacturers in Korea, in China, and uh, <coughs> elsewhere. Are they really coming together and creating this platform for secure uh, distribution? We'll have to see in the next one or two years. One clamorous piracy case recently came out of California where there was a guy who was a high official in the Screen Actors Guild who was arrested by the FBI uh, for taking pre-release copies of movies and selling them to a piracy syndicate which was making pirate DVDs, putting them on the internet, generally distributing them in every way. Now, does technology play a role in tracking down that kind of that, that, that's, that's clearly theft, and that's theft of the highest value content. Yeah, I mean, th th there are hackers out there, right? But it's always important to be able to include, um, y you know, the secure elements of your production, uh, pre-release, pre-production. Th there's a bunch of technologies that can be used uh, to make sure that, you know, somebody can't just take your, your reels or your files and just go and run with it and, and, and distribute it. Um, there might be a bunch of passwords that are required. It might, might be a bunch of uh, do dongles that you use to, to uh, ensure you are the correct user. Or basically, think about um, putting your content in five different places so that uh, you actually have to bring them together in order to um, do your final production work. So, so it, it, uh, secure uh, content distribution starts from the start, you know, where, where you are actually looking at uh, the... The, the, the creation of the content right up to the, the distribution site, which is le the last stage. Macy, I want to turn back to uh, culture change. And you mentioned graduated response, which is known in some popular press as the three strikes policy. Um, do you see that as having made a substantial difference in Korea? Is, is, is it having the desired effect, not so much you know, you don't want to criminalize the consumers. You want to persuade them to buy the legitimate product. Is, it, is, it, is that working? Well, well, yes, but we're not really just banking on the legislative changes. You know, in the way it works in Korea is that they would send um, warning letters uh, to users. Uh, and if that user um, 
gets three warning notices, uh, then his internet access would be suspended um, for up to six months. Um, and since they started this process uh, in, well, the, as I said, the law, start, uh, the, the law was passed and came into effect in June of 2009, and they started sending out letters. Uh, I think over 100,000 letters have been sent out. And only 11 people have had their uh, internet access uh, accounts suspended. So only 11 people have had three notices. So you can see that the, the percentages are actually quite low. I think what was more important uh, surrounding these legislative changes was the education process that came on. The government really then, you know, went to the went to TV, went to the newspapers, on the internet, blogs and forum sites, just publicize this information. And all the ISPs sent notices to their subscribers telling them about this change in law which was going to come into effect. And so, you know, when they did a survey, um, like a f six months after the law was passed, about 70% of the people had actually heard of this law. And so that in itself was a deterrent. You know, and, and we found out, and at least the Korean government found out, and they really didn't have to enforce it so much because you know, there was a, a cultural change, but a cultural change coupled with a, uh, the known fact that there will be a deterrence. And if it's, if it's just a law and they said, okay, you'll be sent a notice or something like that, I don't think uh, without that deterrent effect of having your internet access cut off, I don't think it will be as successful. But the fact that that can happen, and that has happened, um, actually has made it more successful. Arun made the point about some of the other things going on in the background that have helped culture change. And, and I think implicit in that analysis was the idea that Korea actually has a large number of people who are creators, who are making songs, making doing games, making, uh, making uh, videos as well, video content, and selling it throughout Asia. Does culture change, and I'll address this to either one of you, does it work in countries where they don't have substantial production industries? Can it work? I think the production of it would follow. You know, the, the creative aspect, and if, if creators find that they can get, actually get a return on their investment and their time, then there would be more investment and, and, and there'll be more creativity uh, going into, into the whole, uh, for the music industry at least, you know. There certainly has been more bands coming out and more people investing in, in the industry. So I think, you know, uh, just having culture change is not enough. Uh, it's got to be sort of like, big picture, all the pieces need to come together. And Absolutely. one of the things I want to mention in, in Korea also was that legitimate uh, services then started springing up. You know, in, back in 2000, we saw maybe you know, two or three legitimate music services. Uh, and in, in 2008, when the law came into effect, uh, more and more services came online. Uh, and you know, the availability of legitimate content uh, helped uh, in that process as well. So it's not just one thing uh, that has affected this change. I think it was just, you know, just pieces, as I said, pieces of the jigsaw just falling into, uh, into place. Um, and uh, one of the things that you mentioned actually at, at your opening, John, was that, you know, uh, it can't be free. Uh, it can be free to the consumer. It's just that somebody has to pay for the content. It could be the OSP, it could be the advertiser, you know, it may well be free to the consumer. But then we also found in, in Korea that the consumer many a times is prepared to pay for good content and good high quality content, you know. So it wasn't, it wasn't that, oh, the consumer wants it for free uh, and that's it, you know. Some people don't want, I mean, they can get a free MP3 version of that song, you know, which, you know, to me personally doesn't sound very good. And if you pay just a bit more, you know, it could be $5 a month subscription or it could be at the expense of watching a few advertisements, you get a higher quality uh, experience. Uh, and that's what they want, you know. So and, and, and this begs now the iTunes question that Issa referred to because iTunes was 
a market leader in, in uh, bringing low price, reasonably priced digital products to consumers and getting them to pay for it. Um, but for years we've heard in, I live in Hong Kong, you know, here in Singapore, we've heard, you know, you can't get iTunes in Asia. Is that still true? Well, I don't know whether there's anybody from Apple in the room. Should, maybe <laughs> should ask, the question should be, be asked ask Apple. to Apple, actually. Because from the music um, company's point of view, from the record companies, I know they give Apple a global license. So it's really Apple's prerogative where they want to introduce iTunes. And in Asia, I think they have it in Japan um, and in Australia, where it's very successful. But this you know, pay per download model may not work in Asia. I mean, we've found that uh, you know, Asians tend to like subscription models. They like things on their mobile phone. Certainly, you know, the mobile phone penetration is very high. So they tend to like things on their mobile phone. Uh, they may not necessarily want a you know, 99 cent download uh, per track kind of business model. You know, so, so the excuse that you know, even if, if iTunes come into Hong Kong, it may not do well, may do well, I don't know. You know? Uh, but that's, that's not, you know, it should not be an excuse for piracy because you know, there are, in, in Hong Kong, there are about 10 legitimate music services available. So you can get your music. You just can't get it on iTunes, you know. Um, uh, so I think it is available, and I think that's a very, very important part of that that puzzle. Hmm. To I think have this the also music has available. a problem with availability. I mean, if if you offer an iTunes in Singapore, which they do, there is a Singapore iTunes store. Um, but the thing is, the catalog of content is less superior to what you can get in the U.S. So what you end up doing is you end up having to get a scratch card or a top-up card from the U.S. and having to have it either SMS or sent to you by a, a various services. So until the, the content owners recognize that you can't treat markets as second tier territories, you have to give them the same level of content, the same availability of content, uh, and also offer them the payment solution so that they can make the payment. Because without the payment, they'll go over to the piracy. Yeah, there's, there, there's some people who say, oh, you just get a US credit card and you overwrite oh, the whole thing. Oh, but I don't, that's know. nonsense. That it, is it absolute is a little nonsense. bit frustrating to do that. Yeah, yeah I have a US credit card, but I don't want to be, you know, have to jump through hoops and use my US address and all of that in order to get the, the, the content, you know. And that's something I think that, that other players are working on. I mean, I think the previous panel, we had the Singtel guy, and Singtel has M's, which is a legitimate uh, music platform. And I think they'll be trying, you know, very, very hard to get as much content in there as possible. I mean, one thing that, that is uh, a, a misconception is that record companies want to lock up their content. I think record companies do not want yeah. to lock up their content. They want to sell as much but, to as but, but you know many what? people at, at, as at possible. At the same time, I know? think the operators here have to realize that content is not free. They actually have to pay for it. They kind of run along to the government and say, look, we paid too much for TV. Can we get an get a incentive back now? You know, I mean, there's, there's a level of uh, cost to good content. So, so operators need to realize this, and um, there's a level of competition that needs to stay with content, um, you know, with large operators trying to get content. Like Sports TV recently, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, developments. Uh, I think that that step needs to be taken, and that maturity in the whole industry has to be realized not only on the consumer end, but the other, on the government end and on the operator's end. So the operators need to realize that yeah, they actually have to take that risk and pay for this content because they're doing this business of content delivery, content distribution. I, I think there are a range of actors around the industry who unfortunately feed the idea that content is just kind of an add-on. Like, you know, you got certain uh, electronic equipment manufacturers who want to sell the hardware and the content is just a freebie. And in South Korea, there's an example. The, one of the big mobile phone companies now also has an IPTV service. So you, if your family buys three mobile phone subscriptions, they give you the IPTV, take the whole bouquet. What really matters is those mobile phones that they want to get out there. So I think that attitude devalues content implicitly, and, and it is a problem. It leads to the Competition needs to stay in place. I mean, the framework for competition needs to stay in place. Um, and some ris uh, risks need to be taken on, on the part of large operators uh, to, 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 to be involved in this game, um, you know, so. <coughs> but I do want to go back, your, your point, your point that, you know, content can be free to the consumer, but somebody's got to pay for it, and then you mentioned Hulu, 
yes. leads me to say that again, though, in the case of Hulu, there's there's licensing problems. You know, we we don't really get Hulu's full service here in Asia. You know, is do, do you think the content industry, Isa, is going to move to more global licenses of the kind that Macy referred to? Is that where we've got to go? Okay, well, I, I can't really comment on the licensing aspect, but I know for sure the technologies are available. Uh, in, in Japan, you find a Rota system, you know, from Dentsu. There's a bunch of different developments. In Korea, there's a lot of developments. Uh, definitely the infrastructure for, for content distribution on a, on a regional or global basis is already there, right? So it's a matter of these lawyers, maybe, maybe it's the lawyers who have got to sit down and figure it out and, and find a way to distribute the content uh, where, where, where it needs to go. Yeah, we we certainly have a global network now. There's no doubt about that. Do you, um, how about in the in the games industry? I mean, you're 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 regionally focused. <coughs> What's the connectivity globally? I mean, do people from the say North America come and play games on servers in in Asia? I think it's a less common occurrence that direction. I think that you see more people from the the Asian market looking at North American content, and that also has a huge impact on the cost of bandwidth. So we often spend a lot of money pulling content from North America to Asia, so you end up having to pay again a premium on the bandwidth cost, whereas the traffic going the other way from Asia to North America is almost free. So there are barriers in terms of uh, North American or, or Western market uh, adoption of Asian content. And I think it's also because the, the style of content is, is generally different. I mean, your protagonist in a Western content is, is often the kind of weedy joker looking guy, whereas in, um, in, in Asian content, your uh, hero is often the, the more androgynous kind of looking star as well. So there's, whether or not content is universal and can go back and forth, I'm not too sure. But I actually think that the, the interesting idea of transmedia, of being able to syndicate music, film, uh, animation, games together. And it is coming together, isn't it? Yeah, a lot of it's coming together. That's when you start collecting revenue on the merchandising, you start collecting mm. revenue on the, on the peripheral advertising around the content. Um, if you're going to do a campaign which is going to launch into a new movie, there's a game that goes with it. So it's actually not so much, it's going back to your suggestion that the end user is not necessarily paying for it, but the marketing dollars that are promoting the film are building new content. Per, uh, transmedia content around the IP so that it actually can be monetized and yet still everybody within the ecosystem is relatively happy. Say, so we were talking about good examples. We talked about Korea. Have you got any particular bad examples in mind? <coughs> governments, I mentioned governments who put their heads in the sands and don't want to don't want to get in the way of the illegal downloaders. I think I think the no like absolutely bad, uh, bad governments. I think every government wants to try and do good, you know, by their citizens and whatever. I think what, what our, our um, difficulty is to persuade the government that the protection of IP uh, and the protection of copyright in our case is really in, the, in their own interest. It's not that they are protecting a foreign um, foreign government or for yes. foreign rights holders' interest. It is in their own interest. And once you get that, the government's mindset around that, then, then it clicks together, you know, and most governments would have the legislative tools available um, to start doing what they want to do, you know. And, but they just have to realize that it's not, it's not that, uh, it's sort of like a vicious cycle. If they don't protect the copyright, then there is no investment within that country to create more content, and then they will just be consuming more and more foreign content. Pirated foreign content. Exactly. Drives out, Pirated yeah. foreign content, you know? But, you know, I mean, even if in, in a big, uh, in China, for instance, the local record company, the local music industry is suffering as much as we are suffering. And most of, and they are going out of business um, so, uh, faster than the foreign record companies, because they actually don't have they, they don't have the foreign markets that the foreign companies have. You know, they just rely on the Chinese market. And if, if their stuff is not protected in, in China, then that's it. They got out of business. You know? So it's, once the government realizes that it is in their own interest to protect IP, I think that's where we get a lot of the shift. And I think it, it, mostly in, in Asia, I think we are getting that. We are 
getting that. So we've certainly seen, you know, it working out very well in, in um, Korea. Uh, and I hope to see more of that uh, all over the place. I, I in my uh, presentations, use a line which is that Asian piracy kills Asian creators first. And I think the problem with digital piracy is it moves at light speed and it's a more efficient killing machine if people, if the industry and governments don't do something to block the pirate vicious, vicious cycle. I know that you mentioned China. I know that Mike Ellis from the Motion Picture Association is going to talk a little later, and I think he's going to talk specifically about developments in China. So um, we can we can we can be confident we'll that that issue. Ask Mike a lot be, of questions. Yeah, ask Mike a lot of questions. Exactly. Uh, um, I also probably want to touch a little, just a little bit about uh, the, the sort of creativity aspect itself. Um, uh, the Center for Content Protection changed its name, sort of protection to promotion, uh, in order to, to support or to, to, to look at some of the creative processes too. And I think that uh, it, it re does require a level of, uh, of maturity um, at the consumer end, but also at the policy government end and you know all the various industries in between to be able to support the creative process and, uh, and allow this cultural change to happen at the various levels. Um, you know, certain freedoms to allow people to play, uh, at, at, you know, providing licenses to, to play in, in public places and uh, allowing people to, to express themselves creatively and stuff like that does play a part in the whole process of creating that environment where people don't pirate as much. So, anyway, um, I think we're gonna we're coming to the end of our time here. It, it might be useful to just summarize a little bit some of the some of the things we've talked about because some of the developments that are hopefully going to move the piracy problem in the right direction include um, virtuous circles, increased creativity in in Asian countries coming from intellectual property protection. Um, Changes in culture using systems like graduated response to induce more knowledge and understanding on the part of consumers. And also preventing large business models. I talked about the rogue websites, preventing large business models from developing around piracy and creating huge vested interests in piracy. We have that problem in the cable TV industry in places like Thailand, where there are very large vested interests associated with piracy of, uh, of content of all kinds. So if we can avoid doing that in the digital era, choke off the pirate business models, that I think would be very constructive. And technological change and change in business models too. Okay, my little teleprompter there is saying Q&A. Have we got any Qs or As from the audience? Anybody want to pose a question to the, uh, to the panel? We've answered everybody's questions. You didn't drink enough coffee during the coffee break. You're all listening to pirated music through your headphones. I hope not. All right, I think we can declare the session to be at an end then. Um, I will thank the panel members very much for joining me on stage and contributing uh, ideas you. to the discussion. Thank you, John. And thanks to the audience. For long.